Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall from Bearded Kendall. I will be your host as always and let's talk about some V8 Supercars. Um, now that I realize this episode's a tiny bit late. Uh, I just didn't get a chance to watch the race until um, Tuesday. So two days afterwards. Luckily, it wasn't spoiled for me. Um, interesting event we had. Um, Saturday's race in particular was <laughs> a bit, bit chaotic. Um, Sunday's race was a bit less so, but that's okay. Um, because there's still plenty to talk about anyway. So, let's just dive right into it. Because I've got some news things to talk about. I want to talk about after the races. Um, so let's just dive right into the race results. First of all, let's start with the qualifying for the Saturday race with Scott McLaughlin taking out pole position with a 1 minute 6.01 uh, and David Reynolds in second place with a 1 minute 6.15, so not far behind him at all. Uh, Will Davison, which I believe is his best qualifying position this year, uh, first of the Tickford cars with a 1 minute 6.159. Uh, Anton, good qualifying from him in fourth, followed by Cameron Waters, Chaz Mostert, Lee Holdsworth, Jamie Winkup in eighth, Andre Heimgartner in ninth, and Fabian Coulthard all the way down in tenth spot. Um, Nick Perkett in 11th, and Shane Van Gisbergen in 12th. Uh, not a great weekend for Shane. Um... Not a lot to say. It looked like the, the car, both Red Bull cars, were pretty awful this weekend. Uh, I don't really think it's down to driver stuff. Um, but, you know, you never know. But um, it looks to me like the Red Bull the Red Bull car is completely all over the place this week, uh, this year, really. Not even this weekend. Uh, Mark Winterbottom in 13th. James Courtney in 14th. Rick Kelly in 15th. Tim Slade in 16th. Scott Pye. Todd Hazelwood. James Golding. Jack LeBrock. Gary Jacobson. Simona Di Silvestro. Macaulay Jones. Chris Piver still standing in for Richie Stunaway with his neck issues. And again, we see the wildcard entrance of Jack Smith in last place on the grid. So, moving into the race. Let's just go with the play-by-play. I have with me my notes that I will refer to in order to remember what happens. Um, so, it was a pretty chaotic start uh, for the Saturday race. And we have a... Immediately, we have an incident, as we often do at Darwin, with all sorts of people. Um, it was hard to tell sort of what happened, um, but basically, um, what ended up happening was that Macaulay Jones, uh, Gary Jacobson, Jack LeBrock, and James Golding all received pretty heavy damage right at the start of the race. Um, I don't think anyone received any penalties for that, so it was clearly deemed a racing incident. Um, and I tend to agree, it was very chaotic. I think it was just a matter of what is some fa fairly inexperienced drivers all searching for some room at the back of the track. Uh, these things happen. And unfortunately, uh, Macaulay Jones ended up in the garage on the end of that lap. Uh, he did come out later on. He did finish the race, but he was down a few laps. And I believe James Golding retired straight away and maybe Jacobson as well. Although, if I just read the race results, I would find out if he did. Um, yeah, so Jack LeBrock and James Golding both retired. From that incident, uh, Gary Jacobson, maybe I was wrong about him being involved in any incident because um, he finished higher up than I thought, but uh, Macaulay Jones, also a few laps down. He was last of the classified finishes, uh, which is a shame, but these things happen at the start of a race. Uh, in lap two, uh, Tim Slade is completely punted off the track by Rick Kelly. Um, <laughs> it's, he received a 15-second time penalty. Um... Oh, you seemed to drive through penalty, sorry. Um, and it was, yeah, it was pretty ridiculous. Um, it's literally just coming up to the um, the hairpin at the back of the, set, at the circuit. I think it's turn six. Um, Kelly tries to cut across from the right hand side to the outside, from the what would be the outside of the corner um, leading up to the corner. He tries to cut from the right side and he cuts over to the left and I guess he just didn't realize he had an overlap on Tim Slade, and he just completely punts him off into the wall, uh, taking him out of the race. Um, <laughs> yeah, 100% Kelly's fault. Uh, drive through penalty seems fair to me, because, yeah, it yeah, it was ridiculous. I don't think he complained about it either. Um, 
yeah, that's life, really. Um, so that was interesting. That was lap two. Also on lap two, on the last corner, uh, Winterbottom and Heimgartner have huge contact, and Heimgartner nearly goes all the way around onto the back straight. Um, from the replays, um, you can pretty clearly tell that Winterbottom simply rides the curb. That curb up there is pretty vicious um, on the last corner. Uh, it's raised. Um, so if you drive over a raised curb, it sends your car into the air, which if your car's not on the ground, you don't steer as well, obviously, which is what happened to Winterbottom. He just understeers into Heimgartner and it has some pretty drastic results. <laughs> um, Winterbottom also straightens out Heimgartner, though, as well, and then a whole bunch of cars converge on this fuss because of how slow they're going, um, which results at the end of Turn 1 with uh, Simona and Hazelwood um, with... Simona, I think, outbreaking herself and running into the back of Hazelwood. Um, either that or Hazelwood slowed up earlier than expected. Um, but I, I'm inclined to believe that Simona outbraked herself because she did lock the brakes. Um, and they both went off the track. Uh, she received a post-race time penalty of 15 seconds for that as well. Um, so if you're wondering why when we get to the results, she's down one spot further or a couple of spots further. Uh, that's why. Um... Again, nothing really substantial to talk about there. It was just a pretty pretty simple contact on both sides. Um, the winner bottom home gardener thing was deemed a racing incident, which I'm not 100% sure I agree, um, but I'd need more information to see if Heimgartner squeezed winter bottom into the curb too tight, which is possible. Um, so, um, overall, I don't really have any complaints about the way any of these incidents um, played out. Um, other things of note, uh, Jack Smith. Oh, Jack Smith. He's been in a lot of races this year. Um, God, he was in a few. He was at Tasmania, I think was his first round. And then I think he was also at Winton. And now he's at Darwin. So he's done a lot, um, which is exactly what they did with Macaulay Jones last year. Um, and, uh, he's just not very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know the wildcard entrants tend not to be good. Um, um, and I, I don't... Like, we only ever see wildcards from BJR, and I'm not sure if it's because the car they give them is, like, bad, <laughs> or if the drivers are bad. Um, I haven't really been impressed with Macaulay Jones, um, so he followed a very similar path to Jack Smith last year, where he came in for a lot of wildcard races. Um, he was at the back of the grid pretty much every race. Um... They announced at the end of 2018 that he would be replacing Tim Blanchard, which he has. Um, and since then, Tim Blanchard's actually been in again as a wildcard entrant, which is pretty funny. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, Jones has just been at the back of the grid every race, you know. Um, and I don't, like, Tim was also in the back of the grid in the same car. I don't know if it's just because BJR's third car is just kind of awful. Um, and they focus all their resources into the, the Tim Slade and Nick Percat cars. Or if Tim Slade and Nick Perkett are just that much better drivers than the, the person in the third car. It's really hard to tell. Um, and ditto with the wildcard entrance. So Jack Smith, he looks pretty awful, to be honest, um, at the moment. Uh, but I don't know if that's his fault. If the car they're giving him is bad, obviously he's inexperienced, so he can't provide much feedback on how the car is doing. He does race in Super 2, um, which I don't think he's, he's challenging for either. I don't think he's challenging for the title in that. Uh, let me just bring up the Dunlop Super 2 results real fast. Um, we've got championships. Let's see where he is in the... Okay, it took me to the regular supercar championships instead of the... There we go. Here we go. Found it. Okay, so in Super 2... Yeah, Jack Smith's in 13th of 20. Um, and the 20th person isn't even racing in the series anymore. So, <laughs> um, he's not doing great. And I haven't been impressed with him in that format either. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what else to say about him other than I think it's way too early to be bringing him up into the main game, especially considering he hasn't really had any good performances even in Super 2. And, um... I mean, you know, it's not like the drivers in Super 2 are bad by any means. Um, that's where we get some... I mean, that's where a lot of our current field came from, um, obviously. 
but I don't think the current crop of drivers are are, are outstanding by any stretch. Um, so I don't know. I'm not I'm not I'm not impressed with Jack Smith, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him in the team come next year, just because he's following a very similar path that Macaulay Jones followed. Um, so eh, we'll see. We'll see what happens, but I haven't been impressed. Uh, not helped by this race where he had a lock up at turn one, went off the track on lap 14. And then again on lap 41, he went off in a different part of the track due to a big brake lock up. Like that's pretty simple stuff, especially at turn one. Um, yeah, it's a heavy braking zone, but the, it's not it's not a complicated braking zone. There's no bumps as far as I know. It's not curved. There's no turning. It's just a straight line break into a double apex corner. Um and if he did lock up at turn five, which is the um, kind of the the corner at the end of the back straight, if you like, in, in inverted commas, um, basically the next major braking zone after turn one, um, he did lock up there, which is much easier to lock up at because that's a much harder corner uh, to break for. Uh, so that's more, way more understandable. But turn one, you know, like start lap 14, he had older tires on. They weren't fresh. Um, you should be able to handle things like that. You know, and it's little mistakes like that that we see from him a lot. Even even Jones, when he was a wild card entrant last year, I don't remember him making any silly mistakes like that. I think he was just kind of slow, um, which made me wonder if it's the car or if it's him or whatever. Uh, but Smith, you know, he's been making some silly mistakes. I remember he blocked McLaughlin uh, as a lapped car in Tasmania in his first round. Uh, it was a bit silly. That was a bit... Um, yeah, but that's less his fault, maybe more his engineer's fault for not telling him to get out of the way. Um, they don't get lapped in Super 2, so he's probably not used to it as much. Um, you know, who knows? All sorts of things, but basically I'm judging him real hard. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't deserve it. Uh, but basically I haven't been impressed at the moment. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we got a full-time gig because there are a lot of contracts, out of, a lot of drivers out of contract at the end of this year. And I've got some things to talk about with that as well. So uh, stick around for that. Uh, on lap 15, uh, Coulthard just completely understeers off the track. <laughs> Straight lines one of the chicanes at the back end of the circuit, um, which is fine. But again, silly mistake from someone who really shouldn't be making mistakes like that. In a car like that, like I've had a lot to say about Coulthard. I'm not going to rail him this weekend because he was okay. But, um, you know. Uh, and... Um, um, yes, the only other... Okay, so... Bleh, let me get my notes in order. Um, uh, Anton was had a terrible pit stop as well, which he was on for a really good finish, which put him right back down the order, which sucks for him. Um, I feel like his championship standing isn't reflective of his actual current ability. I actually really rate Anton. I think he's quite good, and he's been able to not keep up with David... Um, but he hasn't been far behind. He has been pretty much on top of him. Where David's been good, like this weekend, Anton has been there as well. You know, he's not light years away, which is good considering it's his second season and, and Reynolds has been around forever. You know, he, he's got a ton of experience. Um, Anton does not, and he's been he's been keeping up. That's a, that's a rookie or a former rookie driver that I have been quite impressed with this season. I think he's come quite good this year. Um... And uh, it's a shame to see him, his team make mistakes. They made the same mistake again on Sunday with his tyre change. That completely ruined his pit stop on Saturday. Luckily on Sunday, uh, he was taking fuel on board. So it didn't matter as much. But it's still really annoying to see. Quite frustrating um, to see such a talented driver sort of be held back by little mistakes like that. But that's okay. It's not like he's challenging for the title or anything. So not a big deal. Um, but unfortunate for him. And... Um, Will Davison, who was on for a podium, his first podium in many years, I think, um, has uh, is released into David Reynolds in the pit lane and runs into him. Uh, you can't do that. <laughs> you just can't do that. He was pinged for an unsafe release. I think he wasn't. He was just given a 15 second penalty. Um, he wasn't given the usual drive through penalty, um, which is good. I think a drive through for an unsafe release like that is a bit harsh. Um, but it was clearly his team's fault. Um, not his. He couldn't see. He probably couldn't see Reynolds. And when when the team tells you to drive, when you get pulled off those jacks and you're told to go, you just go. You don't look in your mirrors. Um, 
you shouldn't have to look in your mirrors. Um, I'm sure he did, but he probably didn't see him because Ren looks like Reynolds is in his blind spot when he hits him. Unfortunate. Uh, Davison was on for a great result, so that's unfortunate to see, but these things happen in the great sport that we have. So let's go over the final results after the uh, rather incident-packed race, but nothing controversial. Um, I'm going to find the results. I've been moving all my tabs around. Um, yeah. All right, so... After after all that, Scott McLaughlin finishes in first place. And Chaz Mostert in second place. Up from sixth place with an excellent strategy, i got to say. They pitted him early, put him out into traffic, and he was able to fend off uh, David Reynolds behind him, who came in third. So good, good job from Chaz Mostert to secure second place. And good job from David Reynolds for a podium. Cameron Waters in fourth. Jamie Winkup in fifth. Lee Holdsworth in 6th, Fabian Coulthard in 7th, um, I've said it before, I'll say it again, not good enough when his teammate's finishing where he is, um, Shane Van Gisbergen in 8th, James Courtney up 5 spots to ninth, and Scott Pye up 7 spots to 10th, those two seem to be <laughs> incredibly good at overtaking people, um, it seems pretty clear to me that the uh, the Walkinshaw and Dreddy boys have been struggling to set up their car for qualifying for a while now, but it seems like their race car is actually quite good. Um, and their strategy is quite good as well because they've proven that they can carve their way through the field. Um, Anton in 11th down 7 spots after a terrible pit stop with Will Davison behind him in 12th after that penalty for an unsafe release. Nick Perkett in 13th. Gary Jacobson up 7 spots to 14th. Good job to him. He'll be happy with that. The, uh, he is a rookie this year, of course. Um, and um, I go back and forth with how I feel about him, but I think he's doing an okay job at the moment. I think he's doing enough, basically. Uh, Chris Piffer, though, the standaway replacement up nine spots to 15th place. Once again, pulling off an incredible drive for someone who doesn't full-time drive at all. Um, yeah, I was really impressed with him on Saturday in particular. Um, and again, Winton, he did really well as well. Um, so good on him for really putting in the performances when, when he needs to, because his team must be super happy with that. And that might be raising a few eyebrows around the paddock too, to be honest. Um, Andre Hungarner in 16th, down seven spots. He was given a 15-second time penalty for a safety car infraction. I'm not quite sure what happened, um, but I assume he overtook someone or was speeding or something like that under safety car. Uh, well, Mark Winterbottom in 17th. Todd Hazelwood in 18th. Simona up three spots in 19th. Jack Smith up five spots to 20th. Rick Kelly was given a... Drive through penalty, as I already discussed, in he finished in 21st in the end. Macaulay Jones finished in 22nd, a couple of laps down, uh, almost 10 laps down actually. Uh, Tim Slade, James Golding, and Jack LeBrock not classified after the uh, chaos of the first couple of laps. So that was the Saturday race. Um, it was probably the most eventful, although the events that happened weren't exactly. Uh, substantial things to talk about but that's okay because now we move on to the sunday race so let's go with qualifying so remember there's a top 10 shootout following the sunday qualifying and the top 10 was scott mclaughlin david reynolds Chaz mostert rick kelly cameron waters will davison anton de pasquale mark winterbottom fabian coulthard and lee holdsworth just making up the 10th spot and there are a few things you might notice about that first of all rick kelly uh, and Mark Winterbottom being in the top 10. Great job from them. Uh, Lee Holdsworth seems like he's really getting the eye in for that car, which I'm glad to see. I'm still not a hugely... I'm not won over by his performances so far this year, but we'll see. Uh, we're still not even half, we're halfway through the year, more or less. We'll see how he goes with the rest of the time he's got. Um, but neither of the Red Bull cars made it into the top 10 for what is, it feels like forever since that's happened. Um, with Jamie Winkup qualifying in 11th, um, only uh, two hundredths of a second behind Lee Holdsworth. So he only missed out by the smallest of margins. And to put in perspective what we're talking about, um, places uh, from Rick Kelly down to Lee Holdsworth, they were separated by less than two tenths. Um, and that continues basically all the way through the field down to about, down to about 15th. The margins are incredibly close. Um, 
So Jamie Winkup in 11, Todd Hazelwood in 12. Great job from him. Uh, only the smallest of margins behind uh, Jamie Winkup because remember that Matt Stone Racing, the team he raced for is now, is uh, a customer team for Red Bull and it's great for to see him really pulling that car um, to a good result because their biggest comparison would be the Red Bull cars and he's right up there with them. So great job from him. Uh, James Courtney in 13th, Andre Heimgartner in 14th, Scott Pye, Shane Van Gisbergen in 16th place. Yeah, not a great time for Shane. Not a great time at all. I would... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim Slade in 17th, Simona in 18th, Chris Piver in 19th, Gary Jacobson in 20th, Jack LeBrock in 21st, James Golding in 22nd, Jack Smith in 23rd, and Nick Perker and Macaulay Jones both crashed out in qualifying unfortunately for the BJR boys, which means they had to repair all three cars over the weekend, <laughs> which sucks for them. Um, yeah, look, it happens. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's not the first time Jones has crashed out in qualifying. Um, I don't think it's even the second time he's crashed in qualifying. I think he crashed in Adelaide, he crashed here. I think he crashed somewhere else as well in qualifying. I don't remember where, though. But, um... Could be wrong, though. Feel free to yell at me about how wrong I am. But um, he needs to stop making mistakes under no pressure, essentially. It, qualifying, and it, yeah, they're under pressure to drive fast, but you get multiple runs at it. There's no traffic. You're not racing anybody. That's when mistakes are usually made, and he's bidding it in ways that you really shouldn't, you know? Uh, and Percat should know better, but these things happen from time to time. Um, so I'm free, willing to give him a little bit of a pass, although it sucks for his team. It really does. They made it put in a good effort to fix those cars up for the race, though, because following qualifying was the top 10 shootout. So as I often do, I will go in reverse order to raise the tension. Ah, so in 10th was Mark Winterbottom, who didn't even complete a lap um, after he he went to break for turn one, and he you can see it on the onboard replay. His pedal, he says, he describes it as his pedal going straight to the floor and nothing really happening. Um, so basically, his car just broke <laughs> on the first corner, which sucks. Um, he was alright for the race, though. Luckily, um, thankfully, uh, but a shame that we got one one lap robbed from us with that incident. Um, so he was in tenth with no time set. Rick Kelly in ninth place of a 106.2429. Chaz Moster in eighth place, who didn't... Normally, he does a lot better at top 10 shields. I was actually surprised by his performance uh, with a 1 minute 6.2242. Uh, so only two hundredths ahead of Rick Kelly. Uh, Will Davison in seventh place. He was the only one to be using used tires. Everyone else had green tires for their runs. He used... Uh, a pair of used tyres. He actually did quite well on those tyres, to be fair. Uh, with a 1 minute 6.1871. Uh, Anton, in 6th place. Um, fairly good effort from him, you know? I, I'm, i yeah. He hasn't had many top 10 shootouts in the first one he did at Bathurst. I'm pretty sure he binned it, <laughs> unfortunately. So he did a really good job. It was a really good job. With a 1 minute 6.1825. Only just ahead of Will. Uh, Lee Holdsworth in 5th with a 1 minute six. Point zero six one eight. Cameron Waters in fourth. First of the Tickford boys for one minute six point zero one nine five. David Reynolds, the first to break the minute five with a one minute five point nine eight two five. Fabian Coulthard in second place of a one minute five point eight four one two. And who else but Scott McLaughlin with a one minute five point eight two five nine. So Fabian had a 5.841. Scotty had a, a 5.825. <laughs> the smallest of margins between them. Um, and I think the first time in a while that we haven't seen Scotty completely blow everybody away in qualifying. Um, but, alas, he still came first. <laughs> and now, if you're paying attention, that means he's won two of the three things that requires the Triple Crown. If you don't know, the Triple Crown which is not the International Triple Crown, which is uh, Monaco, Indy 500, and the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Um, for us Australians, the Triple Crown is at Darwin. And at, at Darwin, it means winning race one, race two, and qualifying in pole position in the top 10 shootouts. 
Um, and Scott McLaughlin has so far won the first race and qualified in first place in the top 10 shooter. So he's got two of the three conditions cleared for the Triple Crown, which has never been achieved by anyone before in the history of this sport. It has never been done. So it is a big deal. Um, it's not as important as like a Bathurst or something, but it is something to keep your eye on. The fact that no one's won it in 22 years is pretty incredible. So, let's see if he does win it. Um, in terms of the race, uh, it wasn't a huge amount to talk about. Um, there was an incident at the start where Nick Percat and uh, Simona, who always seems to be always involved in incidents this year, uh, speared into Gary Jacobson right at the start of the race, knocking him off. Um, so, if you didn't see it, if you missed it, uh, Nick Percat, Simona's trying to go up the inside of Jacobson at turn five, um, and Nick Percat also tries to go up the inside of Simona at the exact same time. He dives up there. Um, that turn gets quite narrow. Percat runs into Simona. Simona runs into Jacobson. Jacobson goes off the track. Um, um, to me, it looks like Percat tries to just dive up the inside of Simona, not really realizing that she's going for a move on Jacobson at the same time. Um, she turns in because Jacobson's on the outside. Um, Nick has nowhere to go. They all run into each other, basically. Uh, it's a shame that Jacobson came off worse, um, but... Um, to me, it looked pretty clearly like a racing incident, and I don't think any of them received penalties for that. Um, and Wing Cup actually was punted off the track by James Courtney on lap one as well. He rejoined right at the back of the grid, um, and he managed to make quite an impressive fight back up from the position he was in. That car had a bit of pace in it, yeah, at least race pace, um, which was which was nice to see. It was nice to see a little bit of fight from one of the Red Bull cars. Um, but otherwise, we didn't have a, a super duper duper exciting race on Sunday, to be honest. Because, guess who? Scott McLaughlin takes out the Triple Crown with a first place finish on the Sunday. Uh, excellent job from him. He. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what can I say? No one's ever won the Triple Crown. And. What a year for him to do it. He's absolutely dominating at the moment. He really is. Um, and if he was anyone was going to ever win it, it was going to be Scotty right now during this current period of complete and utter domination he's got going. That's an excellent job to him. Congratulations to Scotty for that because that'll be something that I think will take another, uh, another equally long period of time to achieve. Um, David Reynolds in second place bringing it home. Uh, he did fairly... He did well. He raced well. Uh, followed by Fabian Coulthard in third. Um, Cameron Waters in fourth. Jamie Winkup up six spots to finish in fifth. Like I said, after coming back from being almost in last place on the first lap. Um, he did a... He had a great drive back. And i got to say that Red Bull did probably play their strategy, port, their strategy cards fairly well. Um, to, in order to get them both cars up into a good spot because they both they both finished much higher than they started um, there we go just muting my phone so you don't hear it anymore <laughs> um, yeah Red Bull did a really good job to put them where they were uh, Chaz Master in 6 going for an alternate strategy which looked like it was going to come good but I think he just ran out of steam towards the end he only made it up 2 spots but it's better than nothing um, Lee Holdsworth in 7th Anton in 8th Will Davison in ninth, uh, Shane Van Gisbergen in 10th, up six spots, um, clearly lacking the pace that Jamie had, clearly, um, which is unusual for Shane, uh, but you, when they were on track together, you could see Jamie just pull away, and all those spots between him and Jamie were just people slotting into their, um, from pit stops, because they pitted at basically the same time and came out almost at exactly the same place on track, um, and yeah, basically... He would have been in six had it, had he been able to keep pace with Jamie, which he was not. Um, yeah, I 
I don't know what was going on there. Shane's not a bad driver, clearly. He's, he's a championship winner. Um, but he seems to be getting the rough end of the stick a lot this year with the car set up. Um, and Red Bull seemed to really struggle from bouncing back from this, this double spring ban that happened um, this year. They really have been struggling. It's been a bit shocking to see, really, um, from a team like this. But, you know, they'll come good next year, I'm sure. Uh, Andre Hunt-Gartner in 11th. Mark Winterbottom in 12th. Todd Hazelwood in 13th. James Courtney in 14th. Nick Perkett up 10 spots to 15th. He had a great drive. Uh, Rick Kelly in 16th. James Golding up 5 spots to 17th. Tim Slade in 18th. Scott Pye losing spots for the first time in, I think, forever. Uh, in 19th, Simona in 20th, Jack LeBrock in 21st, Macaulay Jones in 22nd, Chris Piffer in 23rd, unfortunately not showing off what he's got, um, like he has been so doing so well over the last few races he's been in, Gary Jacobson in 24th, Jacobson, Jake's, Jakespin, I don't know what I just said then, Gary Jacobson in 24th, um, after he was punted off the track on first lap, but still managing to be ahead of Jack Smith, who was completely incident-free, but still managed to finish behind him. Um, I think that just kind of set. I think that just kind of um, exemplifies what I've been saying about Jack. Um, nothing against the guy; he has a great luscious set of hair, but <laughs> um, he does need to be doing better than that, especially against someone like Jacobson, who is a rookie this year as well. Let's not forget. Um, so that was Sunday. Let's move on to the championship points with Scott McLaughlin in first place with 1,946 points. A whole 319 points clear of his teammate who is in second place. Fabian Coulthard has 1,627 points. Um, so if you're not aware, that means that Scotty is a full round ahead of Fabian on points, so each race is worth 150 points, meaning that a weekend has 300 points up for grabs. So Scotty could completely could just go on vacation next weekend um, and <laughs> not lose anything. <laughs> He'd still be ahead in the championship, which I can't believe I'm saying um, this early in the year, but that's where we are at the moment. After that, though, the, ten- the championship does tighten up quite a bit with David Reynolds in third. Um, 150-ish points back from Fabian. Chaz Moster in fourth. Shane Van Gisbergen down two spots from last round in fifth, with Jamie Winkup right behind him in sixth. Cameron Waters in seventh. Nick Perka in eighth. Will Davison in ninth. Lee Holdsworth rounding out the top ten. Uh, after that, we've got Tim Slade, Mark Winterbottom, Anton Di Pasquale, who he does seem a little far down compared to his teammate, but keep in mind that Mark Winterbottom and Tim Slade and Lee Holdsworth are all within 50 points of him. <laughs> so... Uh, I wasn't joking when I said that um, the championship gets quite tight once you get past the DJR duo. Uh, James Courtney in 14th, Andre Heimgartner in 15th, Scott Pye in 16th, Todd Hazelwood followed by Rick Kelly, James Golding, Simona Di Silvestro, Gary Jacobson, Macaulay Jones, Jack LeBrock, Richie Stanaway in 24th, who I just can't even fairly compare him to anyone else in the championship anymore because he's missed two whole rounds, um, which is... Like I said, a whole 600 points for two rounds, which is a lot. Um, so he's naturally at the bottom. Jack Smith in 25th. Chris Piver in 26th, who has more than half the points Jack Smith does in <laughs> already. And Tim Blanchard in 27th. Another wildcard entrance. Um, for the team's championships, we've got DJR in first, of course, with 3,513 points and a whopping 800 points back as Red Bull. Uh, once again, once you get past DJR, the teams tighten up a bit with Penrite. Erebus Racing now in third place. 1,048 points behind DJR, or should I say 200 points behind Red Bull. Um, with Tickford, the Tickford pair of Lee Holdsworth and Chas Mostert in fourth place. Only 10 points behind Erebus. That'll be, a, that'll be an interesting one to watch. Erebus will be keen to end in third. I think they finished in fifth last year with um, their rookie driver, Anton. Obviously not scoring the same amount of points that David um, that David can, uh, but Anton has been coming good this year and he is putting in, he is making sure that that team can put in a fight for championship, team championship spots. Um, 
The second Tickford pairing of Cameron Waters and Will Davison in fifth spot, uh, followed by uh, BJR, Tim Slade, and Nick Perka in sixth. Remember when they were in third place? That was crazy. <laughs> um, Walkinshaw and Dretti United in seventh place. Uh, Rick Kelly and Andre Heimgartner's uh, portion of Kelly Racing in eighth. Uh, Gary Rogers Motorsport in ninth. Simona and Gary Jacobson in 10th. Winterbottom in 11th. Uh, Todd Hazelwood in 12th. McCauley Jones in 13th. And Jack LeBrock just behind in last place in the team championship. Techno. Techno. Mm, excuse me. Techno being in last. I get the words out finally. Um, now I'm going to do something new. I'm also going to very briefly... Go over the championship results for the Super 2 series, which is something I've been looking forward to doing for a while. Um, so now in every podcast, um, Super 2 races at every round that Supercars races at. And I, ev- after every round, uh, I'm not going to go over the race results in depth or anything like that, like I do in uh, Supercars. But I am just going to briefly talk about the Super 2 points. And at the moment, we've got Bryce Fullwood in first in a Nissan, followed by Zane Goddard in second, having a good battle for the championship, only 64 points behind. Um, keeping in mind, though, that Super 2 points are owned very differently to Super Cars. Bryce Forward only having a maximum of 550 points at the moment, with Zane at 486. Ashley Walsh in third. He's been there for a while now, racing for Matt Stone Racing with 459. Uh, followed by the Kostecki brothers, Brody and Jake, with 434 and 404 points, respectively. Will Brown, who I have got my eye on um, to make it into the big game. Um, I think he shows quite a bit of promise. At 366, Mason Barbera at 362. Thomas Randall at 343. Dean Fiore, who's also been there for quite a while now, at 310. Dylan O'Keefe at 302. Justin Rougier at 269. Adam Marjram at 266. Jack Smith also at 266 in 13th. Uh, Kurt Kostecki, the other Kostecki brother, at 248. Jordan Boys at 234, who I believe tested for Erebus after Winton. I think it was Erebus. Uh, Matthew Charter at 230. Joel Heinrich at 224. Brenton Grove at 219. Tyler Evingham at 169. And Abby Eaton was no longer in the series at 76 points. Um... So I'll just be keeping an eye on Super 2. At the moment, uh, Bryce Fullwood has been racing quite well um, in the series. I've watched a few of the races, and he has been very strong. Um, but honestly, anyone in the top 10, really, has been racing very has been racing quite well. Um, with uh, Thomas Randall, I believe, looking to, looking to get a look in at the Tickford drives for next year. With all the drivers out of contract... And let's talk about driver contracts. So, <laughs> because of the way supercars works, it's very hard for me to actually find a solid list of drivers that are out of contract at the end of this year, but rest assured that there are a lot. So I've been keeping track of those who have been mentioned offhandedly in different articles. And uh, this is incomplete. There are more. I know for a fact that there are more. Um, but ones that I know for sure that are out of contract are... Chaz Mostert from Tickford Racing. Um, Lee Holdsworth and Cameron Waters are all out of contract. So Lee Holdsworth was obviously put on a one-year deal after Mark Winterbottom left to see how he did. Um, Will Davison is, I believe, also out of contract, but it is very highly expected that he will continue with 23 red, and I think that's fair. Uh, he's been driving very well for them. Um... Now, the other drivers that are out of contract at the moment are Fabian Coulthard at DJR, uh, Simona Di Silvestro at Kelly Racing, both Scott Pye and James Courtney at Walkinshaw Andretti, and Todd Hazelwood has put himself on the market over questions about Matt Stone Racing being able to continue in supercars, so we might be losing a team next year, although um, team boss Matt Stone has said um, that it's that they will be doing everything they can to make a return, and they expect to make a return, but they've also warned Todd to put himself on the market just in case. Um, So hopefully we do see Matt Stone back next year. It's good to have more teams and supercars, not less, 
Um, and hopefully, I would like to see them with a full two-car fleet, to be honest. I think they can make success. They've been doing good this year. Um, they just need to find some good sponsors and some good money. But I also believe that... I think Shane and Jamie are both at a contract at Red Bull as well, although I'm not so sure about that one. Um, and I know that there must be more because, yeah, there are definitely more drivers that are out of contract. But the big question is, where will Chaz Mostert go? Uh, so this is one that people have been, especially myself, have, we've been, I've been speculating about this for a while, and there's really sort of a couple of options. Um Chaz is quite young. I think he's 27 or 29. Um, and he wants to win a championship. Like, that's not a secret. He wants to move to a team that can win him a championship. Now, at the moment, that leaves him with basically two choices. He can stay at Tickford or he can go to DJR. That's sort of it. Um, and it isn't unrealistic for him to move to DJR because Fabian's contract is out this year and Scott McLaughlin's contract is out the following year and Scotty has also said that if he wins Bathurst he wants to go to NASCAR so his last achievement that he wants to do in supercars is win Bathurst and he says once he's done that he wants to move to NASCAR in America that's his next ambition that's his next goal but before he does that he wants to win Bathurst and if he's going to win Bathurst you'd think if he was going to win Bathurst any year it would be this year because he has been on fire uh, so it is entirely possible that both drivers will leave at the end of this year. Um, I have no idea what will happen to that team if both drivers leave. Um, but personally, I think that Chaz going to DJR and um, to replace Fabian would be a great move for DJR. Um, I think that would do nothing but strengthen that team. Uh, having Scotty and Chaz in the exact same car would be amazing. Um, I don't think that team would be touchable, especially in the current form that they've got. If they manage to continue their raw car speed into next year and they have both um, McLaughlin and Moster in, in their team, I don't think anyone will be able to touch that team. Um, I really don't. And frankly, I don't think Fabian has been performing well enough to guarantee himself a spot for next year. Um, although um, Penske boss um, what's his name Tim Sindrick has basically hinted that he that they don't want to rock the boat they want to keep both drivers in which is fair I mean it's working for them um, but um, if I was in charge I would be snapping up Mostert as hard as possible because he he's a talented guy he really is um, so if Mostert was to stay in supercars, I believe he'd be staying at Tickford or he'd be moving to DJR. Um, Walkinshaw and Dreddy United have also expressed their interest in him, but I don't think he'd want to move to a team like that. Um, and the other place that Mostert has indicated he might want to go to is he might want to move to a new series. Um, so he's been racing a lot in endurance racing series outside of Australia, um, especially for BMW. Um, and if he's going to go anywhere, it'd be to DJR, it'd be to Tickford, or it'd be out to a completely new series, which would free up another seat at Tickford. Um, in addition, we've got Waters and Holdsworth out of contract as well. Now, Waters is good. I rate him really highly. Um, Holdsworth, I'm not so sure about. Um, and I think who Tickford keeps will really depend on Mostert's decision, and you can see this because Tim Edwards has been saying for a while that he wants to wrap up he wants to wrap up the contract negotiations with Mostert as quickly as possible. So if Mostert leaves, I think they will keep their current suite of drivers and only want to replace one. If Mostert stays, um, I think Tickford might look to replace Holdsworth or Waters. Probably Holdsworth. Um, because Thomas Randall has been looking quite strong in Super 2. And... Um, they might want to bring him up, depending on how he goes in endurance formats this year. Uh, in addition, we've got Welcome Show Andretti. So, uh, it's not a secret that they want Mostert on their team, which means one of their drivers has to go. Now, if you are Welcome Show Andretti, who do you think you would want to get rid of in your team? And I hate to say it because I think he's been 
probably the stronger of the two drivers this year, but it would probably be, it would probably have to be James Courtney. Um, he's fast. He's a good driver, but I think they're looking at his age, and I think they would just be getting a little bit nervous. Um, yeah, you can go to be quite old in supercars. Craig Lowndes proved that. Um, but especially with the recent expulsion of Garth Tander, um, James is now the oldest driver on the grid. Um, and you've got to think he'd be nearing the end of his career. Maybe not so much by choice. Um, so it'd probably be quite hard for him to negotiate away from there as well, given his age. Uh, Mark Winterbottom did it last year, uh, but he was also moving to Team 18, which is a very small team and were probably, were probably just happy to have a driver of Mark Winterbottom's caliber on their team. Um, I can't, I don't know of any other teams that might want to take James. Maybe Matt Stone Racing um, would take him if they if Todd Hazelwood left and they managed to retain their, um, their car for next year. Uh, maybe they'd want someone like James. Uh, that would be a good, that'd be good for them. They, an experienced driver to give them, um, give them hand developing that car, making it better. Especially one that's familiar with Holden's. Um, but if I was Walkinshaw and Andretti, um, I don't think I would want to replace both of those guys at the same time. I think they'd be rocking the boat too much, first of all. Um, and second of all, um, I think both of those guys have been doing the best of what they can. Um, Scott Pye is their most recent race winner. Um, and both of them have had good races this year. You know, uh, They haven't been bad by any stretch. Um, so, and as for Silvestro, um, so <laughs> should the Red Bull stuff be, should I be right about the Red Bull stuff about Shane and Jamie being out of contract? She has actually been quite heavily linked with Red Bull for a long time now. Um, so we could see a shock move from there. Um, I don't think it'll happen, but it's possible. Um, I don't think Silvestro will get moved around unless they want to bring up um, someone from Super 2 like Bryce Forward, which is possible. Uh, but Jacobson is a rookie this year as well and Andre Heimgartner was also is only in his second year too. Um, I don't know if they'd want to bring on that many fresh drivers that quickly. Um, but you never know. Um And uh, I think the other thing to not disregard is that Simona brings quite a bit of market PR with her. She is the only woman in supercars and probably, I think, one of the only women ever in supercars. Um, she brings quite a bit of um, good marketing, good money with her um, for being who she is, basically, which isn't a knock against her. Um, it just means that some teams do want her for the money that she brings. Um not as a pay driver, but as with sponsors and things. Um, and that's that's attractive, especially to the teams that run more cars. Uh, teams like Tickford, teams like BJR, um, teams that need more money like Matt Stone would be looking into that. Teams like Techno, um, that sort of thing, would be looking into that. Um, so there'll be quite a few eyes on her as well. And it sort of depends on where she wants to move to. She'll probably want to move to a team that's a bit more competitive because um, the Nissans have been sort of all over the place, let's be honest. Um, yeah, Rick Kelly and Heimgartner have managed to get quite a bit out of those cars, um, but I think they've been overdriving those cars. Um, I think the true pace of those cars lies around where Simona and Jacobson are finishing most of the time. Um, I think that's the actual pace of those cars and... Heimgartner, props to him for being a new driver that's able to do what he can. Um, and Kelly, um, are sort of wringing the neck of those cars, trying to get them to where they are. And they're doing a good job, but it's just not enough. I think there needs to be more consistency in that team. But I'm not even sure what that team's going to be using next year in terms of cars. I don't know if they're going to continue with the Nissans. Um, but you never know. There's a lot of things up in the air for next year. Silly season is going to be very interesting. But for now, let's talk about the next race. So, where are we at next time? Well, I'll tell you. 
The next race is the Wattpack Townsville 400. One of the... Sorry. The <laughs> second street circuit event that we have on the calendar at Townsville, of course. Uh, taking place in three weeks' time, unfortunately. So quite a while away from now. Um, with the race on Saturday and a top 10 shootout followed by a second race on Sunday. Um... I hope, I hope you're looking forward to it. Um, and I just want to, uh, before before I was about to wrap up, but I wanted to say something else. Um, I think this championship is over. <laughs> I think I think Scotty will win this championship. That's my, um, that's where my money's going at the moment. Um, unless something drastic happens at that team, uh, which it could, but unless something drastic happens at that team. Um, I think Scotty has got this one right now, and I think he's going to win by the most solid of margins. I mean, if this is this we haven't seen this kind of domination since um, Triple Eight Racing, um, like eight years ago, more or less. We're dominating everything, um, and yeah, he's he's out there. He really is. He's he's pretty much untouchable at the moment. Um, if he continues the form he's on, I think he's got this championship in the bag. Um, but watch this space though, because Baffus will be interesting. If he wins that, um, there'll be a lot of news. There'll be a lot of things to talk about. Um, but after all that, in three weeks time, I will see you at the Wattpack Townsville podcast roundup like we do with every race. I look forward to talking to you again then. I hope you enjoyed the race this weekend. I hope you enjoy the next three weeks until the next race. But until then, my name has been Kendall. Ken Kendall? Kendall. Kendall. That's my name. My name has been Kendall of Bearded Kendall. I will see you next time.